Till that point, we thought hackathons were just exercises to build apps. But what we found really interesting is hackathons are not just a way to exercise your skills, but a way of solving challenges. And uh, just this May, another team from Serialytics won the NASA Space Apps Challenge for COVID-19. And we felt that these kinds of activities really should be done more often. And that's why, in addition to competing in these hackathons, now we're providing a wider venue for more people to get involved. And as I'm sure you will realize, you realize when you hear uh, about the stories of uh, our last winners in the last uh, challenge, uh, it can be both a uh, fun and educational uh, experience. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about what hackathons are. Uh, in general, hackathons are rapid prototyping uh, activities. Uh, they the work best with a specific FSD goal or problem to solve. And so you start with a the social or business problem, sure that and over the course of a few, uh, of a, be, you know, predefined uh, period, you hopefully arrive at a solution or an idea. What makes hackathons, uh, well, that is the successful ones work, is not only should you provide uh, a business problem for people to solve, it's about guiding people through a structured and organized process so that they can arrive at a solution that is original but supported by resources. So if you are able to provide this very uh, conducive and mic environment, uh, combined with proactive coaching and common resources such as data and common platforms, teams are then able to exercise their full creativity uh, in solving a wide partners, range of uh, MSU, problems. MSU and at the end of this, we will hopefully arrive at a good pitch uh, and we will be joined by more schools. This kind of, of uh, I would say, uh, activity, as opposed to formal research, is now more uh, uh, commonly known as collaborative ideation. Another word for this is crowdsourcing. Basically, you want to also crowdsource or find innovation by open sharing of data and using a competitive environment. If you are familiar with a website called Kaggle.com, at this point, I want to take a few minutes uh, not just to explain the mechanics of the challenge, but also to explain why we believe in data challenges. Because we are also participants once upon a time in data challenges. And we felt that the experience was very, very fruitful, that it's worth sharing to everyone. And that's the reason why we're now in our second iteration of this uh, BARM Data Challenge. Let's first start with, and sorry to bore you with a little bit of philosophy, but uh, Bangsamoro Data Challenge, it was really more of an informal event just to test whether the concept can work. And now, uh, as Kabsek said, this is the first official one that has the backing of the BARM. In addition, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, our institutional partners, uh, the Asia Foundation uh, and the team of uh, SAM, uh, and USAID for providing uh, some funding to make this happen. Uh, the crew at Data Ethics PH and Serialytics who are all laboring behind the scenes to make sure that this data challenge is not just going to be uh, an exciting experience, but also an educational one. So there will be many uh, events that will be announced after today's launch, and it will be a mix of learning and also crafting solutions. So please look forward to that. In addition, I want to personally acknowledge as well uh, some of the individuals who are also making this happen behind the scenes. Uh, so we have uh, Adi and Giselle from the Asia Foundation, and of course, Mark, uh, Ingrid, and Mike from Data Ethics PH, who are all laboring behind the scenes to make sure everything happens uh, you know, without a hitch. I also want to acknowledge uh, our official education partners. Uh, MSU, MSU Iligan, and the Institute for Peace and Development in Mindanao. And we will be joined by more schools all over the Philippines who have also started to pledge their support, uh, especially now uh, during the time of COVID, where online classes are definitely a challenge. Uh, events like this also provide another venue to learn, uh, especially about data science, analytics, and social impact, which we will be discussing in a few minutes. At this point, I want to take a few minutes, uh, not just to explain the mechanics of the challenge, but also to explain why we believe in data challenges. Because we are also participants once upon a time in data challenges. And we felt that the experience was very, very fruitful, that it's worth sharing to everyone. And that's the reason why we're now in our second iteration of this uh, BARM data challenge. Let's first start with, 
And sorry to bore you with a little bit of philosophy, but if you remember back in the day uh, when we discuss the ways we arrive at truth or facts, I think most of us are used to the scientific method or the deductive reasoning method, where you basically start with a theory about the world uh, and then a hypothesis or a question. And then you do data analysis to confirm whether your hypothesis about the world is correct. If your data supports your hypothesis, then you now have a confirmation of your theory. If your data debunks your hypothesis, then you now have uh, a basis to debunk a theory. Deductive is also the basis of a lot of formal research. What I'd like to share is deductive is not the only way to arrive at fact. There's also, I would say, the less popular uh, but uh, equally effective approach, which is inductive where you actually start with data first. You start with observations about the world. And then through the power of data analysis, you find, if you can find them, patterns about this data. And then that helps you craft new hypotheses about the world. The inductive approach is something that has made data challenges and hackathons possible. It is not, to be fair, a, a replacement for formal research. But what we'd like to put forward here is the inductive approach can form a, a good complement to the formal research approaches we're doing. And especially in the era of big data, we believe that the inductive approach has a lot to offer, especially to social issues such as uh, the BARM. When we joined hackathons about a year ago, uh, this, you know, back in August, was really the first time we encountered hackathons in the flesh. Up until that point, we thought hackathons were just exercises to build apps. But what we found really interesting is hackathons are not just a way to exercise your skills, but a way of solving challenges. And uh, just this May, another team from Serialytics won the NASA Space Apps Challenge for COVID-19. And we felt that these kinds of activities should be done more often. And that's why in addition to competing in these hackathons, we're providing a wider venue for more people to get involved. And as, as I'm sure you will realize when you hear uh, about the stories of our last winners of the last challenge, it can be both a fun and educational experience. Let's talk a little bit about what hackathons are. Uh, in general, hackathons are rapid prototyping uh, activities. They work best with a specific goal or problem to solve. So you start with a social or business problem and over the course of a few uh, of a you know predefined period, you hopefully arrive at a solution or an idea. What makes hackathons, uh, well, at least the successful ones work, is not only should you provide uh, a business problem for people to, to solve, it's about guiding people through a structured and organized process so that they can arrive at a solution that is original but supported by resources. So if you are able to provide this very uh, conducive environment uh, combined with proactive coaching and common resources such as data and uh, common platforms, teams are then able to exercise their full creativity in solving a wide range of problems. And at the end of this, you will hopefully arrive at a good pitch uh, and a solution. This kind of, uh, I would say, uh, activity, as opposed to formal research, is now more uh, commonly known as collaborative ideation. Another word for this is crowdsourcing. Basically, you want to crowdsource or find innovation by open sharing of data and using a competitive environment. If you are familiar with a website called Kaggle.com, they were one of the first uh, to popularize and exemplify this by hosting data sets and algorithmic platforms to allow basically anyone to perform analysis on data. And then now uh, platforms such as Kaggle are being used by institutions, not just to solve problems, but also to recruit talent. We got our first taste of collaborative ideation from the NASA International Space Apps Challenge, and we take a lot of inspiration from it. What we saw in the, Nas uh, the NASA Challenge is they take competitive ideation to a different level altogether by not just providing access to data sets, but also featuring socially relevant challenges. And this is also, as you will see, a big part of how we put together the BARM Data Challenge. Hackathons are valuable, but it's also good to recognize uh, where they might fall, sh fall short so that we don't force uh, an issue too much. 
definitely the strengths of a hackathon are uh, their short term, which can be a very uh, great benefit to organizations such as uh, the BARM and uh, the Asia Foundation who need a lot of ideas in a short span of time. Uh, so the benefit of a hackathon is really the quantity of ideas. So the more ideas you have, the better. Uh, the, also, the benefit of uh, ideation is it's really focused on just a few challenges. You don't want to solve everything, but certain things only. And because of the competitive nature, there can be a very good morale builder, which is also what we want to achieve now, especially during this pandemic. We want to give people a reason to celebrate and uh, you know, while they're accomplishing the challenges, they're also building this teamwork and camaraderie. The net cost of uh, innovation in a hackathon also tends to be quite low because you get a lot of ideas in a short span of time uh, with very minimal investment, which is what we want uh, to encourage more uh, innovation in the BARM. There are also some lookouts. It's not perfect. Uh, depending on the participation, uh, you can get a mixed quality of outcomes. Uh, but we're more than you know happy to say that in the last BARM Data Challenge, the quality of the submissions were very high. And we expect that this will continue in this challenge. Uh, a time limit can also be a constraint because there are some challenges that you really cannot solve in a few months. The point about doing a hackathon is really to generate new ideas that can be pursued by formal research or initiatives after. And at the, and at the same time, uh, these kinds of challenges are highly dependent on the kinds of resources available. So uh, later when we start discussing the themes, uh, we will start also discussing what kind of data will be made available. And a lot of this is uh, stock data that's been around for a while, but also open data from other sources uh, that we've started to gather. And at the same time, uh, participants are open to add new data sources that they find on their own. So you're not constrained to stay with the existing data sets. Uh, but we also encourage uh, participants to use the data sets that have been provided and enrich them whenever you can. One of the, uh, I think, outcomes that we expect is uh, all the solutions will be tailored towards solving a social issue or social impact. And we use the UN Sustainable Development Goals as our common framework. These 17 goals, which have been agreed by countries all over the world, form the foundation of what we try to achieve, not just with data challenges, but also with the efforts of the Asia Foundation, Data Ethics, and Serolytics. We use the SDGs as our, basically our language in solving for social impact. For this data challenge, we are focusing on four thematic areas. Uh, you can propose solutions that solve one or more of these challenges, but the idea behind these thematic areas is they have been discussed at length with the BARM, and it's been agreed that these are the areas that are of greatest interest to the BARM and also reflect the challenges that need to be solved. So we are looking at SDG 4, uh, which is better access to quality and inclusive education. SDG 16, which is building a model for good governance in the BARM. SDG 1, which is bridging economic opportunities to communities uh, and help a lot of them get out of poverty. And SDG 3, which is a community level response to health crises, such as, but not limited to COVID-19. So when we talk about quality uh, education or SDG four, basically the question we're trying to solve is how can data and technology help in achieving inclusive education for the barn? One of the winners of the last challenge actually tackled education. So hopefully we'll be hearing from, from them so you can get an idea of how they chose to tackle it. When we talk about SDG 16 or peace, justice, and strong institutions, we're basically asking how can data and technology help in promoting the important role of civic society organizations? There are many civic society organizations uh, operating in and out of the barn. And what we want to do is find ways for data and technology to empower them, achieve their goals. When we talk about SDG 1 or eradicating poverty, we're basically asking how can data and technology help in alleviating poverty and boosting economic development in the BARM. There are many developments, exciting developments happening now in the BARM. For example, recently the BSP approved the guidelines for Islamic banking, which hopefully will pave the way for more uh, financial inclusion in the BARM. And that's just one very important pillar. There are many other facets of 
the economic development spectrum that need to be addressed. So tackling SDG 1 is of prime focus for the BARM. And lastly, when we talk about SDG 3, we're asking how can data and technology help in COVID-19 response and recovery? Uh, we are not out of the COVID-19 pandemic yet. And from the looks of things, COVID might be persisting with us for maybe at least another year until vaccines come out. But at the same time, we cannot put our lives and economies on hold. So at the end of the day, uh, part of a uh, good and functioning BARM is also helping the BARM uh, adjust and cope with the COVID-19 pandemic. So we look to the participants to help provide ideas on how we can use data and technology to address this. One of the things that we wanted to ensure when we did these data challenges is we entertain and accommodate as many types of solutions as possible. So hope, hopefully you will be, all of you will be happy to, to hear that we are not restricting the type of entries to just applications. In fact, some of these ideas, uh, these are not uh, uh, exhaustive, but we expect uh, participants to come in with maybe one or a combination of the following. You can do a straightforward research study, uh, or if you are a data scientist or machine learning engineer, you can uh, try to use the data and come up with some interesting predictive models, which can hopefully help decision makers uh, make smarter data-driven decisions. Uh, dashboards and visualizations are always welcome because data is generally unfriendly to a non-technical audience. So if you, are, uh, you have the ability to translate data into something that can be easily understood and translated into policies and reforms, uh, that is very welcome. If you're more into the humanities or literary skills, uh, maybe you can use the data to write stories about what's happening in the barn or what good or things that can be improved, basically data journalism. And lastly, if you're more of the uh, tech uh, or application developer inclined, uh, no one is stopping you from coming up with new tools uh, that can be deployed in the barn, especially now that most of us are forced to work from home. The demand for online solutions is highest now, especially in the barn. So of course, one of the ex existing challenges is the uh, areas where there is a, a lack of telecommunications coverage. And we expect our participants to also find ways to bridge that gap because at the end of the day, we're all headed towards the fourth industrial revolution. And if you can empower the barn to get into the fourth industrial revolution, then that will be a game changer. So I, I want to, uh, before I turn it over, show you the, the range of entries that were submitted last, last time. And we expect that this new challenge will yield more ideas. We had examples of uh, a policy dashboard uh, that was uh, created by one team, and they will be presenting a few ideas on that today. We had another, another team that did a study on dropout rates uh, in the BARM area and what contributes to uh, a high dropout rate in, in grade school, for example. We had one uh, winning uh, entry that mapped all the geohazards uh, related to uh, seismic data in the barn so that you can come up with a good risk mapping of places where you shouldn't be building tall buildings. Uh, a group uh, of students proposed using seaweed as a source of bioplastic, and they did extensive research on the seaweed uh, production of tawi-tawi. Another group looked at the uh, presence of poorly maintained roads in the, in the barn area and also proposed a, a model to increase the longevity of these roads uh, by uh, mixing some rubber into the asphalt. Uh, another team created another dashboard looking at infrastructure and identifying areas where buildings can be reinforced. Uh, one group proposed a barter app for the barn because, uh, as you know, the barter system is still uh, quite widely in use. So why not digitize it? And then another uh, group of students proposed a new uh, fishery feed uh, because tilapia and fish pens are quite, uh, quite widely spread in the barn area. So finding a way to increase the productive output of these fish pens can be a good boost to the economy. So this is just you know, uh, tip of the iceberg, we received uh, 16 viable prototypes that actually have yet to be implemented. 
and we look forward to more uh, and richer ideas as we move forward. So before I mention the, uh, 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 turn it over to the last year's participants to discuss their work, uh, we wanna highlight the awards uh, to give us a structure of how we plan to uh, identify who will be the top uh, entries. Across all of the types of entries, what we will be looking for is generally four areas of excellence. One is we want people to show us what is the best use of the Bangsamoro data. So in the last challenge, we only used the open Bangsamoro data set. Uh, in this challenge, we're also going to provide access to the open Marawi data set, uh, which can also yield a lot of opportunities. Uh, we want people to show us what is the best use of data science in the BARM. So on top of using the Bangsamoro data sets and enriching it with other data sets, uh, we want people to role model the use of advanced analytics and machine learning uh, and application development. Any way that we can uh, show how data and technology can be used. And these are things that will also help our local schools in the BARM uh, basically adopt and teach these technologies. We're looking for solutions that are very relevant to the BARM. So uh, it will help for you to understand the history of the BARM, how it came together, uh, what, a, what is the social structure of the BARM, uh, what are the local customs. Uh, there will be at least two tracks. One track will be for people within the BARM to propose solutions for the BARM. And there will also be a track for people who live outside BARM and from the outside looking in, what ideas can you contribute to the development of, uh, of BARM? And finally, we're also looking for solutions that are practical. And when we say practical, it's not just about cost. It's about ease of implementation. Uh, it does not help anyone to propose a very, very complicated solution that is next to impossible to implement. So keep that in mind that we want things that are immediately impactful and based on solid research. So at this point, uh, maybe uh, it's time we, we turn this over to uh, some members of the audience who, you, who participated in the uh, last challenge. I'm just going to uh, identify them. We had Xavier uh, Puspus. He was uh, awarded the uh, most practical solution. I think we had... Uh, Leo Carlo de la Cruz and Adam Amistad. Uh, they were the ones who were awarded the best use of data uh, in, the, uh, in the BARM. So I'm uh, making them a co-host now. And then finally, we had the team of Albert uh, Yumul. Is Albert here? And they were awarded the best use of data science for their research work in education. So, uh, maybe Xavier, uh, you can go first if you want to share uh, right. your work. I'm going to stop your screen from sharing. Okay. Welcome, Xavier. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this call. Um, hold on. All right, guys, see my screen. Uh, 2020 hashtag most used uh, words of the year. Um, but yeah, uh, good evening to everyone. Um, thank you for uh, all of you who want to join the competition. Um, I, I would sincerely hope we uh, get more uh, submissions for this year compared to last year, because uh, um, I, I would I would um, I would think that the pandemic would cause people to be more into a lot of online competitions because we're well, on traffic. Um, but yeah, uh, my submission was really more on using the Bangsamoro data set. Uh, and enriching it with um, USGS and FEBOX data for earthquake. Um, basically, objective was to expose earthquake and tsunami prone areas in ARMM. Uh, a brief background with that is um, uh, there, there was this like uh, this earthquake um, that caused the Midnight Killer, which is the 1976 Moro Gulf tsunami. Um, it's a cluster M8 earthquake. Basically, it means it's like dozens, if not more, of magnitude eight earthquakes that hit uh, ARMM or uh, that was ARMM before um, that killed around 8,000 people in their sleep. I think it was around uh, 3 a.m. Um, but fast forward to more recent days, um, basically the entire Mindanao is the most uh, seismically active 
sort of major island in the country and so it was my so it, it was my um objective to basically map out all of the earthquakes uh, that are happening there so just a quick context um warm is actually getting hit by more earthquakes now more than ever before um well there's really two two reasons uh, for this data set or for this trend to occur it's really one um there were there are more sensors these days um, and two, well, we are, we are seeing more um, seismic activity in the Pacific Ring of Fire. But uh, all in all, if you naively forecast for the entire thing, um, you actually see a higher trend. Uh, but obviously, you know, um, it's completely impossible to predict earthquakes. But just to drive my point home, there's really a uh, there's there's a need for uh, such an awareness in where you actually put up your buildings, where you put your evacuation centers, where the more active locations are, where the least active locations are. And uh, in order for us to do that, basically we just wanna be able to, uh, you know, expose the potential locations of the highest damage from earthquakes and tsunamis. So the way I did it, the more technical approach for those who are interested in learning, um, it's all open source. Uh, all the tools I used here are all free. So obviously I used the data source uh, called Open Bank Samoro, uh, and then I um, enriched it with FIVOX, USGS, and PSA data. So PSA for population, USGS for uh, more minutia um, seismic activity, and then FIVOX because, you know, Philippines. Um, and then data preparation, I just use Google Collaboratory. It's a free uh, Python sort of notebook service uh, by Google. And then it's a package called Geopandas to visualize everything and then I deployed everything using Kepler, which is also a free visualization tool. So uh, just very quickly, I was actually able to create this sort of, um, uh, this is an interactive, or well, this was a bit as an, in, as an interactive website. Well, it's really more of a dashboard of the activity, but uh, I think um, if the video plays, so uh, right here, you see that as uh, time goes by, there's really more activity, and then there's a lot of cluster earthquakes. So uh, from then on, you just uh, take a look at like a visual inspection and see which areas are actually more active and which ones aren't. So just to give a, you know an overview of what are some of the things that you can actually take a look at, um, so the Sulu Trench is actually a bit more a seismic. Um, uh, there are, uh, I've, I've, I've actually confirmed that there are a lot of sensors out there, but there's just really very less activity uh, to be measured. Um, then the Cotabato Trench is the most extremely active, which is crazy because the road networks here, which is from BARM, the, da the, the data set that we pulled this from, uh, was, uh, is actually located right beside it. So that's pretty, um, you know, it's pretty dangerous. Uh, and then some of the more notable historical earthquakes, I just mapped them out uh, through time and how they would look like in the, in the dashboard. But yeah, just a few quick insights, you know, the Cotabato Road networks are actually the most susceptible to damage, which is... Uh, pretty dangerous because you know if your road networks are down, is it it's completely impossible to reach out for those relief operations and for those who need rescue. So the seaport called Kalamansig, the one that's actually right in the middle of all the activity, is <laughs> the uh, is in the middle of uh, the most active fault line in Barm. And so uh, just to end this talk, um, we're actually long overdue for a big one. So there's really a need for visualizing everything um, in terms of you know a geographical sense because. Uh, well, as far as uh, as far as I know, when I built this 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 sort of visualization didn't exist yet. So, but yeah, some of you, some of the few recommendations is to fortify Cotabato, um, build quake resistant infrastructure, or build them where there isn't a lot of earthquakes. Relocate that seaport, which is extremely active, because you know uh, if it's a lot, it's if it's shaky, then all of the infrastructure there is uh, um, in in danger. So. We're now actually also be able to trace disaster relief routes because we we can um, overlay the road networks with the with the with the earthquakes themselves, um, and then uh, we want to be able to evacuate those who are um, prone to tsunamis. So I just want to be able to uh, share very quickly the visualization live. Um, it's a website, but um, this is just a local deployment of it. It's interactive. You can actually click on stuff, uh, and Barm has a copy of this. So this is the fault line. This are the earthquakes, and it's live. It plays. You can also pause it. But yeah, it's 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 really um, a very very uh, simple visualization, but it's also pretty powerful because uh, right then and there you can already see which ones are safe, which ones aren't. So that's it. Thanks, Doc. Thanks a lot, Xavier. And uh, for for the other prospective participants, uh, 
you can see how Savior added and enriched the data set. So the the data on tremors and geohazards uh, did not exist in the original Open Bank Samora data set. And now uh, Savior took the time to get data from FIVOX and USGS to enrich that data. So now it's part of our broader data set. So some, some of you might be interested to look into uh, their work. We'll be posting links uh, to all of the submissions in the last challenge. It's actually publicly available on a GitHub repository and we'll make, uh, we're making it available uh, on the data challenge page and on Facebook as well. Okay, so after Savior, I, I'd like to invite uh, Bash, uh, Yumol, and Jerisa Osorio uh, to share their work on uh, education. So they did uh, uh, analytics and research work on, uh, on the education sector. So Bash? You want to share your work? Okay, guys. Um, so Thank good. you, Doc, for introducing us. Okay, so good evening, guys. So um, education in the Philippines still remains a privilege and um, it's not accessible, especially to our rural communities. So uh, based from this study from PIDS, uh, uh, the the Barm uh, the Bar Bangsamoro region identified as having the highest average um, out of school children in the country. So uh, this shows us the urgency of improving the quality of education in the region. So um, next slide, Bash. So last year, the Bangsamoro Organic Law was approved, um, which led to the establishment of the Bangsamoro Tran Transition Authority to aid the transition in the and the development in the area. So uh, the BTA chairman, Murad Ibrahim, he identified that um, education is one of their top priorities, spe specifically figuring out the causes of the high dropout rate. So that's, um, for, that's why for our entry, we want to find out uh, what key indicators, what, what are the key indicators to improve uh, student attendance in the Bangsamoro region. So, okay. Next slide, Bash. Yeah. Okay, that's the article from Rappler where he highlighted the need to improve education and health. So the objectives of our project is to identify the key features. So we use the random forest model in order to uh, identify those features that are most uh, effective in predicting the student attendance. So the other one is we made an interactive map uh, that communicates the result for the for the results of our model to observe how each indicator uh, affects student at attendance uh, down to the barangay level. So the granularity of our analysis is down to the barangay level. So for our data sources, um, they came. This uh, data came from publicly available uh, data sources such as the DOH list of health facilities nationwide, uh, the Armed Conflict Location and, and Event Data Project, or ACLED, and the FLEMS 2015 Household Data. So, and we also, of course, we also utilize the data drive of Open Bank Samora. So, next. So, our objectives were accomplished uh, through this methodology. So, uh, first, of course, uh, data from various sources were gathered and processed together in preparation for modeling. So we did um, data processing, data wrangling, then modeling. Then the results are then map mapped out in an interactive um, in an inter interactive way that easily communicates the insights for everyone to understand. So even policymakers can easily understand uh, the map, the interactive map that we made. So for the results, Bash. Yeah, thanks, Jer. So here are some of the results that we've had. So before we input the features that Jerisa mentioned, we first look at the interactions of those variables. So interestingly, no, there are many insights that we have seen on the data set ng Bangsamoro. For example, um, nakita namin na yung mga schools kapag malayo, parang alaki ng probability na Malaya din yung mga clinics or hospitals. Um, other variables include na kapag um, OFW, yung nature ng livelihood ng isang family, um, 
most probably, hindi pa nila pag-aari yung bahay nila. Hindi pa nila pag-aari yung lupa nila. So, it's really nice to play around with these variables using uh, standard statistical models that we use in industry. No? But it's very interesting that these tools can be applied to socially relevant problems. And simple tools lang na ito na ginagamit na sa industry. And tuwang-tuwa kami na nakikita natin na ina-apply ito uh, na pinapakinabangan ng ating local communities. When we applied the machine learning model, as Teresa mentioned, we used a random forest for our feature importance. So what it does is it, it ranks uh, all of the features kung sino yung pinaka uh, malaki yung contribution dun sa model na ginagawa namin. Interestingly, no, we saw that the biggest factor kung bakit mataas yung dropout rates ng students natin sa Bangsamoro region is that they lack uh, birth certificates, which is obvious, no, you really can't uh, enter formal education without uh, lacking formal IDs that needs uh, that's needed for registration and so on. No, other features na nakita namin na mataas yung um, importance din sa model ay yung youth labor, no, uh, presence of um, youth labor, no, parang inaagawan niya ng oras yung mga students natin na sa halip mag-focus sa studies, no, the environment is there for them to have a job because of uh, poverty and other features, no. Um, yung last dito, top three na important feature ay kapag yung bahay nila, uh, concrete, gawa sa concrete, uh, ibig sabihin, mataas yung chance na they will be able to ano, attend school. Kapag hindi concrete yung bahay nila, of course, mataas yung incidence na uh, yung probability that they will not be able to afford a uh, basic education. Okay? So as Teresa mentioned, we created maps no, that sana ma-apply, magamit ng mga um, decision makers natin. No? Uh, this plot here is called a bichloroplet map. So makikita dito na uh, yung features na tinitingnan natin, yung incidence ng out-of-school youth at saka certain features such as birth registration, no? yung mga pink dito, dun yung mataas na incidence ng out-of-school youth or drop-out rates. No? So fo focus for efforts, for intervention, for help, for aid can be directed through these target areas. And we also made an interactive dashboard no? that they can integrate to their existing dashboards um, so they can um, have easier access to these uh, tools. So here are some of the conclusions, top level lang, no? to address bureaucratic roadblocks, requirements in first school admissions, such as birth certificates, uh, and the like must be accessible to a lot of people. There's also a need to address barriers such as poverty in the face of youth labor, electricity, and access to clean water. So in particular, nakita namin na yung Maguindanao, yung Cotabato, Lanao del Sur, and Basilan can be prioritized first kasi nakita namin dun sa features na sila talaga yung pinaka nangailangan ng uh, immediate help. Okay? So yung recommendation namin, syempre, uh, top, um, hindi pa naman ganun ka-comprehensive yung study, it can still be enriched with other alternative data sources and so on. So, at last na lang, uh, from Yasmin Borsan Lau, many do not find the registration of marriage first and that relevant unless they seek employment. And the process and cost entailed further discouraged registration, so mahal yung mga birth certificate. Gladly, no, noong February pa namin ito ginawa, pero ngayon, may news na, na yung efforts ng Bank Samoro, no, uh, sinimulan na talaga nila at na nila uh, na i-emphasize yung importance ng birth registration. So, I think uh, ang laking validation yun for us na yung models na ginagamit namin nagre-reflect din talaga dun sa mga na-observe ng ating mga uh, namumuna dun sa uh, Bangsamora transition and we're really happy about that. That's it on our end, Doc. Thank you for letting us present. Thank you, Jay. And uh, Bash, uh, I, I think for for the benefit of the prospective participants, uh, what they what this group did is they tried to integrate, no? and I think they were successful in unearthing a lot of insights by putting a lot of data sets together. So if you start exploring the Open Bank Samoro data sets, you will find data on a lot of things, no? infrastructure, uh, you will find data on locations of schools, you will find data on uh, incidents, events, and, and really the, the sheer amount of data is uh, quite a lot for policymakers to make sense of. And this is why we feel that doing a data challenge like this can help shortcut 
uh, the time no? from processing this data to coming up with concrete uh, you know, uh, outcomes. And uh, actually, we're seeing a lot of questions already come in. No? And uh, in fact, this is really what the Data Challenge is also doing. No? By doing preliminary work, we're opening up more questions. And hopefully, the, the new entries will start adding to the work that was previously done and developing it further. Um, last but not the least, uh, I'd like to turn the floor over to uh, the team of Leo uh, de la Cruz uh, and Adam uh, Christian Amistad. Uh, and uh, they, can, uh, they will be talking about uh, the work they did in building together a, a unified dashboard for the BARM. No? So over to you, Leo and uh, Adam. Okay. Well, I'll be sharing my screen. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll will be presenting our entry titled Insight at a Glance. So actually, this is just a data visualization dashboard project. So for the problem, using data for regional planning, Decision makers find it difficult to extract insights regarding persisting development challenges in the Bangsamoro region, such as low education, uneven governance, limited access to credit, and vulner vulnerabilities to natural disasters. So there's a need to organize different forms of data, such as images, tabular, and spatial data. So our proposed solution is, is, is to create a collection of interactive dashboards that aim to provide exploratory and analytical capabilities for decision makers to gain insights regarding specific developmental challenges. So to give you an idea, we'll be sharing a snapshot of our dashboards. So we created four. So, so for the social, it shows the low access of education and limited number of schools. Uh, in the Bangsamoro region. And the next one is the governance. It's more on the level of governance perce uh, perceived in relative to other region. And the next one is uh, for economic, there's a limited access to banks and investment institu institution. And the last one, env environmental. So, so it shows the area of vulnerabilities to flood and landslide. Actually, this dashboard can be accessed through this link and can be seen in the uh, Bangsamoro link. And actually, this is short, so thank you for listening. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, Mark shared the, the link to the GitHub on the chat. So for those of you who want to check out, not just the, the ones that the solutions that were presented here, uh, but also the other finalists. So I can see some of you were, for example, curious about the, the project related to seaweed. So actually that, uh, that those papers are there. No? So we encourage you to check them out. And definitely the, the solutions that were proposed in the last challenge are by no means uh, you know, comprehensive. They're really just starting points for future work. So do not hesitate to reach out to the previous authors and offer to, re, to, to build on their work. I mean, that's what uh, you know, data challenges are meant to do, is to open up new hypotheses. Okay, so we're reaching the kind of the top of the hour already, so time flies now. Uh, I guess to close uh, this event, I would like to share a few things. Uh, a lot of the work we do in data ethics uh, and serialytics is uh, and especially with partners such as the Asia Foundation, is about social impact. And you will see this in some of uh, a lot of our other work uh, in other areas. We believe that data can drive social impact, not just in uh, areas like BARM, but for the entire Philippines. And we believe that to unlock social impact requires the combination of at least three factors. First is we need people who have the requisite skills uh, like data science, analytics, uh, and we need the, the, a sustainable supply of these knowledge workers. Otherwise, we will not have, you know, kind of the, our, our soldiers for the fourth industrial revolution in tackling all these problems. Second is, even if we had 
the skills, uh, they need kind of their their implements no? or their tools. And this is the availability and ease of access of public data sets and open data. Otherwise, you will not have any data to do science with. And what we're trying to role model with the BARM Data Challenge is that by exposing these previously unknown, to be honest, and uh, closed data sets, you can come up with a lot of ideas. But even if you had the skills and the data, if you don't have the right projects, I think that's the, the third most crucial element. We need targeted data science and analytics enabled R&D projects uh, that are aligned to the objectives of government, private sector, and uh, academics. Uh, because there's so many problems to solve, we need to prioritize. And also what we hope to role model with uh, events like the BARM Data Challenge is to openly communicate to everyone that here are the top areas that BARM wants to focus on. Find people with skills, find data to use, and see if you can tackle these top uh, you know, priorities. And I think that will be the first step in unlocking real data-driven change. So uh, I think that's pretty much it that we wanted to share. We hope that uh, excited everyone. I think the last two things that uh, I want to leave everyone with, uh, which I also shared in another talk, is first is uh, you know, uh, basically a word of inspiration from a fellow dreamer uh, who I also consider an inspiration. Uh, he said that if something is important enough, even if the odds are against, you should still do it. And I think there's there's a lot to be unpacked in that statement because a lot of us who, for example, work in industry or commercial sector, we're often motivated by you know relatively material things, or we decide to take on jobs, we, we decide to take on projects uh, because there's a high chance of success. Uh, but if you want to really thrive in social impact and driving change, you have to look at those problems that people ignore, those problems that people think can never be solved. And that's the first step in you know, achieving truly fulfill, fulfilling kind of change. Uh, and we've already tried doing this ourselves. We have had a few successes. And this is our way of you know, opening this world uh, to everyone to give it a shot. And lastly, I, I think I, I firmly believe in this, uh, especially during a time of pandemic, spend the time, the, the, the few waking hours you have in a day doing something that you really, really uh, enjoy. You know, don't spend it doing things that you hate. Do something that inspires you. Do something that inspires others. And hopefully, uh, the BARM Data Challenge can serve as an inspiration to, to everyone to achieve this. Okay, so thank you for attending our ceremony. Before we close, uh, maybe we can all turn on our cameras and do a quick photo op so that we can show everyone how passionate we are about, uh, about the BARM Data Challenge. So please open your cameras and maybe Mark, you can help me uh, take a photo. Okay. I think Leo, we can't see your face now. You look like a cartoon character, you know, but <laughs> you need a little bit of light. Okay, uh, everyone smile. Okay, three, two, one, taking a photo. All right, let's take another photo. Okay, three, two, one, smile. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, with that, good evening, everyone, and hope to see you uh, join the challenge. Uh, please go to barm.opendata.org.ph for updates, and we will be posting more updates on Facebook. Uh, on behalf of everyone in the BARM Data Challenge, this is Dominic Ligot uh, signing off, and thank you very much.